If you follow the channel somewhat longer, you certainly will know that I am really fond of reading original sources like letters and diaries written by the people who basically lived in the same time as the composers that we admire, that we study, research and want to perform. It's really opening your mind in some ways, except from the fact that it's really fun reading. So often I come across, certainly in the preparation also for this series of videos, nice quotes, nice, nice texts that I actually want to share with you. And I thought, why not do that in a kind of two weeks um, series, Historical Voices. So I'm going to start with that today by giving you um, a description of a guy, a certain name, I have to look on my paper, a certain Edward Schulz, he was English musician, who visited Beethoven in 1824. So that's really wonderful. Imagine that you would get a telephone call by someone saying, hey, you know who I met today? No, yeah, it's Mr. Beethoven. You are really wonderful. And so what did you do then? Wouldn't that be fun? But actually, if you read that, it's like getting such a phone call. So without further ado, let's dive into that. And I hope you like it. Just let me know if you would like to have more of these. This might be a little bit longer episode, but this is really a mind blowing uh, uh, piece of, of, of history because we will learn about Beethoven in his daily life, the way he interacted with people, very friendly. He was not the brutal human being that sometimes uh, many of people today still believe he was. Um, he, he will be talking on Handel not on Mozart, he will not say, he says one line on Mozart, which is really, 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 really telling all at all. Uh, we learn about Czerny and things like that. So it's really interesting. I hope you like that. Before starting reading this beautiful quote, just a quick shout out to my Patreons on patreons.com. They, from this month on, are really official sponsoring three videos a month, the two live streams, masterclasses on Sunday evening, and one regular episode. So if you're not familiar with that, patreons.com, there's a link in the description and here in the video is a website where you can support the work we are doing. Um, make it sustainable. There's a little community that's growing actually rather fast. And uh, next to the different rewards you have in the different tier levels. So you have $1, you have $3, you will, $3 you will get the audio CD quality file, files of my recordings. You have $5, you get a personal scan of my score. Um, if you tune in for patrons, you will get the personal scan of all the partitas, my personal score with the fingerings and everything that I have scribbled up on the uh, score, you will get it for free. And on top of that, we will organize in the future monthly hangouts with you on Patreon so that we have direct contact if you have questions or just want to have a little chat with me. Um, and even on top of that, I'm adding content on the Patreon wall for all the patrons. Like now I'm editing the partitas you will get as a patron, no matter what tier level you opt in, all the uh, edits in CD quality, because I think the patrons, you deserve this shout out because you make more possible than you think. So anyway, there we go. In 1824, on 1823, excuse me, the 80 to 28th of September, as Mr. Schanz is writing, will be ever recollected by me as a Dies Faustus. In truth, and by the way, this Mr. Schanz met Beethoven already in 1816, so they were acquainted a little bit. In truth, I did not know that I ever spent a happier day. Early in the morning, I went in company with two Vienna gentlemen, one of whom, one of whom Mr. H, which was Hasslinger, one of the publishers of Beethoven, is known as a very intimate friend of Beethoven to the beautiful situated village of Baden where Beethoven was. About 12 miles from Vienna, where the latter usually resides during the summer months. Being with Mr. Haslinger, I had not to encounter any difficulty in being admitted into his, so Beethoven's, presence. He looked very sternly at me first, but he immediately after shook me heartedly by the hand as if an old acquaintance. For he then clearly recollected my first visit to him in 1816, 
though it had been but of a very short duration, a proof of his excellent memory. By the way, this is coming from the Beethoven biography by Chandler, English tra translation, supplements. I found to my sincere regret a considerably alteration in his appearance, and it immediately struck me that he looked very unhappy. The complaints he afterwards made to Mr. Hasslinger confirmed, confirmed my ap apprehensions. I feared that he would not be able to understand one word of what I said, and this, however, I rejoice to say, I was much deceived, for he made out very well all that I addressed to him slowly and in loud tone. From his answers, it was clear that not a particle of what Mr. Hesslinger uttered had been lost, though neither the latter nor myself used the machine, they mean a hearing machine. From this, you will justly conclude that the accounts respecting his deafness lately spread in London are much exaggerated. I should mention, though, that when he plays on the pianoforte, it's generally at the expense of some 20 or 30 strings. I really wonder if that could be the case, but anyway. He strikes the keys with so much force. Nothing can possibly be more lively, more animated, and to use an ep epithet that so well characterizes his own symphonies, more hygienic, energetic than his conversation when you have once succeeded in getting him into a good humor. But one unlucky question, one ill-judged piece of advice, for instance, concerning the cure of his deafness, is quite sufficient to estrange him from you forever. He introduced his nephew to me, so Karl, a fine young man of about 18 who is, in the, own, who is the only relation with whom he lives on terms of friendship, saying, you may propose to him an enigma in Greek if you like, meaning I was informed to acquaint me with the young man's knowledge of that language. The history of this relative reflects the highest credit on Beethoven's goodness of heart. The most affectionate father could not have made greater sacrifices on his behalf than he has made. After we had been more than an hour with him, we agreed to meet at dinner at one o'clock in that most romantic and beautiful valley called Das Hillental, about two miles from Baden. After having seen the baths and other curiosities of the town, we called again at his house about 12 o'clock, and as we found him already waiting for us, we immediately set out on a walk for the valley. Beethoven is a famous pedestrian, and delights in walks of many hours, particularly through wild and romantic scenery. This was really true. If you were on a walk with Beethoven, you had to hurry because he wouldn't stop. Nay, I was told that he sometimes passes whole nights on such excursions and is frequently missed at home for several days. On our way to the valley, he often stopped short and pointed out to me its beautiful spots or noticed the defects of the new buildings. At other times, he seemed quite lost in himself and only hummed in an unintelligible manner. I understood, however, that this was the way he composed. And I also learned that he never writes one note down till he has formed a clear design for the whole piece. The day being remarkable fine, we dined in the open air. And what seemed to please Beethoven extremely was that we were the only visitors in the hotel and quite by ourselves during the whole day. The Viennese repasts are famous all over Europe and that ordered for us was so luxurious that Beethoven could not help making remarks on the profusion which it displayed. Why such a variety of dishes, he exclaimed. Man is but little about above other animals, if his chief pleasure is confined to a dinner table. <laughs> this and similar reflections he made during our meal. The only thing he likes in the way of food is fish, of which trout is his favorite. He is a great enemy to all Jean, and I believe that there is not another individual in Vienna who speaks with so little restraint on all kinds of subjects, even political ones, as Beethoven. He hears badly, but he speaks remarkably well, and his observations are as characteristic and as original as his compositions. In the whole course of our table talk, there was nothing so interesting as what he said about Handel. I sat close by him and heard him assert very distinctly in German 
Handel is the greatest composer that ever lived. I cannot describe to you with what pathos, and I am inclined to say with what sublimity of language he spoke of the Messiah of this immortal genius. Every one of us was moved when he said, I would uncover my head and kneel down on his stump. Haslinger and I tried repeatedly to turn the conversation to Mozart, but without effect. I only heard him say, in the monarchy, we know who is the first, which might or might not apply to the subject. Mr. Czerny, who, by the way, knows every note of Beethoven by heart, though he does not play one single composition of his own without the music before him, which is true, you have other sources that say the same, told me, however, that Beethoven was sometimes in inexhaustible in his praise of Mozart. It is worthy of remark that this great musician cannot bear to hear his own earlier works praised. And that's interesting. And he was surprised that the sure way to make him angry is to say something complimentary of his septets, trios, etc. His latest production, which are so little relished, relished in London, but much admired by the young artists of Vienna, are his favorites. His second mass he looks upon as his best work, I understood. He is at present engaged in writing a new opera called Milusin. The words by the famous but unfortunate poet Grillparzer. He concerns himself very little about the newest productions of living composer and so much that when asked about the Freitschutz, he replied, I believe one Weber has written it. But there are other issues between both of them. You will be pleased to hear that he is a great admirer of the ancients. Homer, particularly his Odyssey and Plutarch, he prefers to all the rest. And of the native poets, he studies Schiller and Goethe in preference to any other. This latter is his personal friend. He appears uniformly to uncertain the most favorable opinion of the British nation. I like, said he, the noble simplicity of the English manners and added other praises. It seemed to me as if he had yet some hopes of visiting this country together with his nephew. I should not forget to mention that I heard a manuscript trio of his for the pianoforte violin and violoncello, which I thought very beautiful and is, I understood, to appear shortly in London. The portrait you see of him in the music shops is not now like him, but may have been so eight or ten years back. I could tell you many things more of this extraordinary man who, from what I have seen and learned of him, has inspired me with the deepest veneration. But I fear I have taken up your time already too much. The friendly and hearty manner in which he treated me and bade me farewell has left an impression on my mind which will remain for life. I think that's beautiful. And very close, as if we were sitting next to Beethoven. So this is a last, rather long excerpt. I will try to find some shorter as well, but if you haven't heard from this, the one daily life, one day in Beethoven's life, thought worth sharing with you. Hope you like that. If this is your first time here on the channel, as always love to have you subscribed. We have more videos than only talking about historical voyages, but that was the topic of today's video love to have you subscribe to the channel share this video with your friends thank you for staying here with me and we see each other very soon again bye